characters and uh, still tried to remain true to the the essence of uh, of who these characters are. Versus pulling directly from the source material and keeping it that way. Right. Yeah. Being being like slavishly devoted to the details of the of the source material in terms of story beats. Right. Yeah. No, that I mean that's that's understandable. I mean, we still. I mean, here we are, ten years later. I mean, in in May when Infinity War comes out, mm-hmm. it'll be ten years, and here we are. Right. You know, a decade later, yeah. doing an entire podcast devoted. Isn't it these movies? Isn't it wild to think that ten years ago, like Iron Man wasn't even out yet, and and the whole concept of a cinematic universe, like the best example of that that you had was like the Universal Monsters, you know, from from like the the forties. Yeah, I mean, you you had, I mean, you had that, and then. I mean, just in terms of, like, long-term franchises, um, when you had some, you had some instances of crossover in, say, like, Star Trek. Uh, sure. With, you know, characters and yeah, stuff. Yeah, but that's, but that's, that's, not, that's a little bit different, because that's just different entries in... That, that's, not a, that's not a movie franchise where the story arc is, is interwoven throughout many films... And even many That's genres, right? Because right. in in the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even even in just the in, even in just Phase One, you have um, you have science fiction sort of melded right. with fantasy. You have sort of like uh, you know a war film, you know a period right. piece. You have uh, sort of a corporate espionage kind of kind of things going on in Iron Man and Iron Man 2. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just, just it, and the way that it's all been blended together is really cool. So, Caleb. That is true. Caleb, what was, what's the, when, uh, for Ant-Man, what was your favorite part of um, Ant-Man? My favorite part was probably when, uh, at the end where, where uh, what's his name? Uh, Paxton uh, says there's a big hole in the roof. Oh, <laughs> the 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 cop, the new yeah, the new boyfriend of Cassie's mom. Yeah, he says there's a big hole in the roof. Yeah. Why and is that your favorite part? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, that's not my favorite part. My favorite part is when. Ant Man goes subatomic. Oh, when he goes subatomic. Yeah. That's I'm glad that you brought that up because that's actually something that I wanted to mention. I thought it was really cool how um he, Yeah, he used one of his shrinking uh discs, put it in his regulator, then pressed the growing button mm-hmm. and then he was able to grow back. To come to back normal out of it, size. huh? Yeah. Yeah. And then Pim had no idea what he did. Yeah. To get out of the sub subatomic, what would you call it? Subatomic world or? realm. The subatomic no. realm is what they call it. But um, what's interesting about that is that if you look at the way, and and Caleb, you haven't seen this movie yet, but if you look at the way that that was visualized, it bears a lot of resemblance to the different. Um, sort of trippy, fantastical realms that the ancient one sends Doctor Strange through when she's kind yes, of schooling him on on how uh, you know on how much more there is to the world than he understands. And I think there's, a, I, I think that's very intentional, probably. And I, uh, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, well, I think even in the in that same sequence that that Kayla mentioned, there is a. There is a visual clue, a visual Easter egg that I think is going to eventually bear itself out in the Ant-Man and the Wasp sequel that comes out this summer. Oh, sort of that silhouette of the of the figure there that he sees. That's that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Now, and I and it's not a spoiler because it's all over the promotional material, and she's listed in the cast. 
uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is going to play Janet Van Dyne. Yes, I, I did. I did hear that. That's that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think probably. Part if, of what I, go ahead. Part of what I'm wondering is: is there going to be another flashback sequence where we see her uh, as as the wasp out of or like her younger self, kind of de-aged, because mm-hmm. it would have taken place right within a couple of years of when Michelle Pfeiffer played Catwoman in Batman Returns. Right. Yeah. Well, so honestly, be able to achieve that. Yeah, honestly, I would be really surprised if they brought an actress like Michelle Pfeiffer on just for a flashback sequence. I suspect that, and I haven't seen the trailer. I know you have. Um, I I would kind of be really surprised if trying to retrieve her from the subatomic realm would not be a major subplot, or, or you know something that that figures heavily into the story of uh, of Ant Man and the Wasp. Oh, I, I'm I'm sure that's going to be a, a big piece of it. Yeah. Um, so, Aaron, what what kind of grabbed you about this about this film? So we talked about it a little bit earlier when we were talking about Edgar Wright. When when it was announced that he was going to do this, I was completely on board because Scott Program versus the World is one of my favorite movies. Period. I just absolutely love it. It is arguably probably the only quote-unquote romantic comedy that I own. <laughs> um, and because uh, I really don't like that, that genre of film, but I just love um, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. And so as soon as they said Edgar Wright, I, I, I was completely and utterly in. Yeah. Um, when they announced that he was not going to any longer be involved, that's when I got... Uh, worried, but I think one of the great ways to frame this film is essentially Ant-Man takes your chosen one origin story trope that we're so familiar with Mm -hmm. in the MCU now and essentially injects it so that it becomes a comedic version of Ocean's Eleven, essentially. Well, yeah, Ocean's Eleven is a comedy anyway, but... Right, but yeah, no, you're right. It it is it, it is the first heist movie of the MCU. It is. That's that's for sure. And and I... it's fun how they you know they've really leaned into the comedic aspects of some of these films. Uh, you know, of right. course, um, you know, with Guardians of the Galaxy mm-hmm. uh, was was a very comedic movie, and and so was yes. this one. And and just some of the gags uh, here are, are are just really priceless. Um, Caleb, what what did you think was the funniest part of this movie? Well, I don't have I don't really have a specific uh, one, but I have many different ones. Okay, what's one that you can remember right now? Well, I can remember all, all of them right now, actually. Okay. So should I tell you all of them or just the one? Tell me two. Two. Two good right. funny parts that you so, remember. So, I like the part where, uh, where, where, uh, when, uh, Scott was blaming Hope for kissing him. <laughs> that was kind of funny. And also when, uh, Scott said to Hope, were you aiming for the hand? <laughs> that was okay. good too. Yeah. Um, one of my <laughs> one of my favorite uh, gags in the film, and it was kind of a subtle one, but I thought it was great. Is uh, you know when he's when he's at the the Baskin Robbins, and mm-hmm. and his boss says Baskin Robbins always finds out. <laughs> like <Yeah>. what <laughs> is Baskin Robbins shield? Like, right. why do they always find out? But then when he's, uh, you know, we're talking to the, the crew later and he says, you know, they found out. And then one of the guys kind of just shakes his head dolefully and says, Baskin Robbins always finds out. Right. No, they, they, they know, man. You wonder how they know, but they know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another smart piece of the writing that I really appreciated in this film was when Pim was was uh, describing the problem to to Scott and and telling him what he wanted to do. And Scott says, "Okay, I think that our first move should be to call the Avengers." 
<laughs> and and it sort of it's a nice lampshade on the question that you always kind of want to ask with these solo movies. You know, in a universe where the Avengers exist, why do you not just always call the Avengers? Right. But then I mean, but but then there's you know Pym's reaction, right? He says, "Look, right. I I spent a lifetime trying to keep this tech out of the hands of a Stark. I'm not about to, to do that." Right. Right. And then later in the movie. They essentially have to do exactly that by breaking into uh, the the defunct uh, Stark yeah, Industries the, the facility unquote, that is now the new Avengers storage facility. facility. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really like and and you know say what you. I know that some of the there's a there's a widely levied criticism against the music of the MCU that it's just kind of forgettable and like just kind of stock music or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I think that can be true with some notable exceptions. Um, the uh, The Avengers theme is a really Absolutely. stirring piece of music, and when when you get the little hit of that Avengers theme as as that bass comes into view, that was really cool. Um, right. You know, the Captain America theme, the Captain America march, is a great great mm-hmm. piece of music, and when you hear that just at the beginning of Winter Soldier, and then when you get the little hit of it as Loki disguises himself as Captain America for that second in uh, in the, the Dark World, you know that's really fun. Right. So all of these musical you know cues and callbacks that that sort of are um, are woven throughout the films are a lot of fun. I had I had recently rewatched uh, the Dark World. Uh, right before yeah. I saw Thor Ragnarok, and okay. and that yep. that mournful little little uh, dirge that the uh, that the theater players were were playing over over you know theater Loki's death scene was actually yep. the same music that was in the movie in that sequence. Yeah, I mean it. It's one of those things where if that's done well, I mean there's a there's a particular um, moment. Not necessarily in a Marvel film, but in the most recent uh, Star Wars film, The Last Jedi, yep. where they so I actually take still haven't very... I still haven't seen that. okay okay <laughs> so. um, but they they take a very well known piece of uh, music from the original trilogy and they reuse it in a way that before you even know what's going on in the scene you know what's going on in the scene because of the musical cue. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So Caleb, do you have anything else that you would like to sort of mention about, about this movie and, and any thoughts that you have on, on, uh, on what the characters do and, and how they grow as characters and so on? Not re- not really. No. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about the, the the themes and the character arcs here just a little bit because Absolutely. because there's some there's I think there's some really interesting things going on here, um, you know, when 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 Hope is trying to get him to to really you know master the 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 Ant Man technology in terms of being able yep. to communicate, and she says you got to you got to mean it and you have to commit. Right. Um, and that's a you know that, that's a significant thing for for his character because uh, you know he wasn't committed enough to his to his marriage to make it work, yep. and you know he his you know he's he's devoted to his daughter but he hasn't been committed enough to making um, making the choices in his life that he needs to in order to really be a good father to her. Yeah, and uh, which is. It's interesting because you see some of that same tension that you know that Scott has in his life. You see some of that same struggle and that same tension essentially manifest between Hank and Hope in the film and kind of the resolution that comes of that that is is happening at the same time and kind of serves as a foreshadowing of the resolution that, that Scott gets by the end of the movie when it comes to him and his daughter and right. how he's now back in as part of her life and yeah. that kind of thing. So I thought the fact that they kind of double layered that idea in the film yeah. was really good. The sort of father daughter dynamic that you get from a couple of different angles. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, I mean, 
I you you had mentioned that that line about you know you have to commit the um, I actually had that written down in some notes. 